Hello folks, welcome to the first ever webinar of Parenting Today's Teens. I'm Jeff C., your host for today, and we are really excited to have Mr. Mark Gregson on the show with us. Mark is the founder and director of Heartlight Ministries and also Parenting Today's Teens Radio, which is heard nationwide on over 1,500 radio stations uh, in the U.S. So we're really excited to have Mark with us today. Mark, thank you so much for coming. Hey, you bet, Jeff. Good to see you. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit, for people who are, are coming to the show maybe for the first time, what exactly is Heartlight Ministries? You know, Heartlight was started 25 years ago with the intent of working with struggling kids. We take kids from all over the country that are struggling, having a tough time, maybe spinning out of control, and um, so they come and live uh, here with us on our property. Uh, we have 15 buildings that they live in with about 40 staff, and we work with those kids, work with the parents, and we try to get them home as soon as we can. Awesome. How long are the kids usually there for? Is there a certain amount of time? It depends which day. Some days it feels like they're here way too long, and uh, other days uh, it seems like it flies by, but most kids are here 10 or 11 months. Uh, and, you know, we're a residential counseling center. Uh, we're a treatment center for kids, and so yeah, I think what's interesting is what we've learned throughout the years after we've had 2,600 kids live with us. Uh, that, um, that, that the culture has almost crossed with with the lessons that we've learned and so we spend a lot of time now helping parents understand the culture maybe get an idea of what doesn't work any longer and help them uh, develop some new skills perhaps to uh, to engage with their child differently gotcha well that's a good segue right to um, parenting today's teens now parenting today's teens like we mentioned in the intro was is a radio show that's heard across uh, nationwide um, but it's so much more than that. It's, you know, resources and stuff like that. So talk a little bit about what the Parenting Today's Teen section is that uh, is here at Heartlight. Yeah, you know what, what's kind of happened through the years is, is, that, uh, is that Heartlight's become an emergency room. When, when parents are, uh, don't know what to do and, and it's spinning out of control and they're saying, hey, my child is, is, is just not going to be around in a few months or, or they're going to be in a worse spot if we don't do something then they can send their child to Heartlight. You know, that's for 60 kids a year, and that's a little difficult for me. And so uh, a number of years ago, somebody said, we need to start something different and start engaging with the general population and saying, let's take these things we've learned and apply them to, to other parents, help other parents understand what's going on so, they're, so they never have to send their child uh, to come live with us. And so um, we started writing books. I, uh, we started uh, getting on the radio, and it's kind of surprising to us how, uh, how it's taken off so much, and, and uh, there aren't many Christian stations that we're not on. Um, but books has taken off. I spend almost every weekend of the uh, year traveling and, and speaking at seminars. But our whole intent is to, to take all the wisdom and the lessons we've learned and say, okay, let's apply it to the to the hundreds of thousands of people out there that need something desperately. And so that's where we're spending a lot more time, I think, uh, engaging uh, in non heart like things by doing the Parenting Today's Teens. Um, really quick before we get right into the, uh, you know, some questions, um, can you talk a little bit, I know you just finished up a, a conference there at Heartlight called Families in Crisis Conference. Can you yeah. tell people what that is exactly and, and what the purpose is? Yeah, you know, I, we have uh, eight retreats a, um, a year that we tell families that if you're spinning out of control and you don't feel like you're quite ready to send a child to heart light, but yet you know that your resources are being depleted, uh, I mean, just physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, there's no answers and your child continues to spin out, then we have a retreat here. And uh, probably 30 to 40 people come every time we have the retreat. We get to, they get to spend time with our staff. I spend a lot of time teaching. They get to meet with some of our kids. They're involved in small groups. It's a great opportunity. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for these parents. And 95% and of, the, of the folks that participate in those uh, family and crisis conferences never have to send their child uh, to Heartlight, which we think is a, a great plus. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, Let's just kind of dive into some questions. This weekend, coming up on your radio show, uh, you're talking about the five characteristics of uh, a good rule, a good rule for the household and for, yeah. for families. Yeah. So what, in your opinion, what really makes a good rule for households? 
Well, you know, I, I, I think you know, we all have heard throughout the years that rules without relationship causes rebellion. Josh McDowell said that like a million years ago, and so everybody pretty much understands that. But, but relationships without rules causes chaos, and I think most homes don't understand maybe how they need to to piece together kind of a boundary system and a belief system where what what do you believe what do you feel like your policy and procedures are for your home and focus on just a few things within your home to change the the overall nature and so so i think there's a there's there's a number of characteristics that are important when we start saying let's develop some rules for our family that we can hold to and kind of figure out which ones are important, which ones aren't. And it really goes to the first characteristic of, of that rule would be this, that rules have to be relevant. I mean, they have to pertain to uh, the world that your child lives in. I, I've always said that you can raise your child to live in a zoo. You can raise your kids to live in a zoo, or you can uh, uh, train them how to survive in the jungle. And, and so whatever we're doing to, to, to train our kids, it's got to be relevant, it's got to apply, there's got to be some purpose to it. And So I tell parents, what are those issues in your home that are so important that need to change? What are those things that are that cause you the greatest concern? And What are those issues that cause the greatest conflict? Then you need to build a handful of rules around all of those things that are spinning out of control so that you give guidance to your child and, and help them along a path and, and get them to a point, which is really the definition of discipline, get them to a point where they want to end up and keep them from a place where they, they don't want to go. So they have to be relevant to the kids. Gotcha. How do you, let's, you know, it seems a lot of times in parenting we're either, um, you know, really trying to, you know, buckle down and, and you know, really lay down the law, and then other yeah. times, you know, we're supposed to give grace. How do you find the balance between grace and then, you know, real structure and, you know, being really a disciplinarian? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, legalism doesn't work anymore, and I, and I think the exercise of authority doesn't work anymore as well. I, I think that's, that's an outdated uh, parenting style that, that we're, we're forcing our way into kids. You know, I, I, this is one of the things that I, that I say most of the seminars, Jeff. Uh, I've never heard a mom say that I want to have a perfect daughter, and I've never heard a dad say I want to rule my son with an iron fist, and I, I've never heard parents come back and say, you know, we want to be judgmental parents, but I can tell you this, I've heard hundreds of daughters say my mom wants me to be perfect. Uh, I've heard hundreds of sons say my dad rules with an iron fist. He's so legalistic, and sadly I've heard thousands of kids say that my parents are the most judgmental people I know. And, he, and, and so there's just old styles that don't work. And one of those things that doesn't work is the legalistic attitude of laying down the, the black and whites and, and being so harsh on making sure that we're developing a great program and that we appear well, that we miss the heart of our child. And we really miss the part of discipline that gets them to a point where, where they really want to end up. And so, so the legalism factor has got to quit. Grace has got to abound. And, and grace is moving toward your child when, when they've done something to offend you, when, they've, when, when you decide to give them something, not just material things, but give them something when they least expect them. Uh, you surprise them with, with, those, with those special comments or those special words of affirmation. It's like introducing your son somewhere and saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. This is my daughter that I poured my life into and, and means the world to me. Not said at times at a wedding or at, at church when you have to say things, but just common little things that your kids can hear and see and, and, uh, and pick up that you're saying to them that, that really ushers in an atmosphere of grace. So I, I know, and since I know you, I know that you, you're not all just let them do what they want and, you know, everything, you know, I'm going to give them everything, you know, and I won't say anything negative or, you know, harsh to them. You still have boundaries. I mean, you still oh, say that we need to have boundaries in our home. Uh, you know, absolutely. I, I think what you have on one side here is a is a, a, a world of grace that's relationship-based, and then on the other side over here, what you have is 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 a structure and rules that, that, that really kind of tell us, okay, how are we going to engage our family? And so we let the rules determine the consequences and the and the rules support our beliefs and the rules give direction and guidance and I and I do that 
so that I can be freed up as a parent to love on my child and speak truth into their life as we engage one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I, I think what's what's happened, Jeff, is, is that we haven't moved from from a teaching mode to a training mode, and, and, and it becomes very important. You know, we're not told to teach up a child in the way he should go. We're told to train up a child in the way he should go. And so we've got to move from a teaching mode to a training mode because it means this. It means that we move from dispelling information to now imparting wisdom. And it's different because moms, and this is especially true for you, if you become just another source of information, and dads, if you become just a know-it-all, your child will cut you off in a heartbeat. They're not looking for more information. They're not looking for more material. They don't need more scripture. They don't need more Bible teaching. They don't need more of that. What they need is someone to take those words of scripture, to take those biblical principles, and teach them how to apply it to their life. That's wisdom. Wisdom is the principles of right living uh, that are gained through observation, reflection, and experience. And so you want to make sure that that as I spend time with my child during their adolescent years, that they're observing me, that they're reflecting on how I'm discussing things with them and challenging them to think. And we have certain experiences that they can embrace and hold on to. Those will be the things, those will be the things that they teach that they talk about at their weddings at those special times in their life. And I think one uh, you talked about this in the in the weekend broadcast that's coming up is that how important it is for our rules for our kids to be obtainable and not just you know overwhelming them with something that they can't they don't have any experience or know how to do so how would you how would you set up rules that are obtainable in the home okay here's 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 a good rule as an example I think all of us ought to be able to do a thousand push-ups a day and you go okay it's a good rule and it's and it sounds good and you and I know we'd all be healthier if we did that, and we'd be athletic, and we. But do you really think that everybody can do that? I know some people that can, but I know that most people can't. And so, if I set that up as a rule, and I place that before them, and what happens is this: they get frustrated. It it becomes futile. I think they become fragile. They start to go, you know, I can't live up to these expectations. And so, whatever the rules is, Jeff, it, it's got to be obtainable. I, I've got to look at my child and say, what is my child capable of? And then maybe I, 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 I let them, you know, perhaps we have some discussion on what do you think you can obtain in this? Do you think you can be respectful to mom? Can you be, be respectful to your brothers and sisters? Can, um, can you not lie? Can you not, I mean, it's all those things. Because here, here's the thing like lying, I mean, I, that I think is so important that uh, we have a, a child that picks up the habit of lying. Well, they lie every day. Well, when they lie every other day, you just had 100% improvement. Now they lie every third day, every fourth day. The rule would be, because if I always nail them when they lie, and I discipline them when they lie, and I don't see the growth that's happening, which is usually going to come over a period of time, then, then I, I, I have something that's unobtainable for them. I've got to make sure that, that they can obtain. When I say you need to quit lying today after they've been doing it for four or five years, that is unobtainable. I've got to be practical. I've got to move toward them. I've got to engage with them. I've got to, I've got to allow them to fail. But I've got to encourage them also with that graceful relationship atmosphere that I create at home. Yeah, good. That's good stuff, Mark. What, you know, I think that parents a lot of times, especially Christian parents, struggle with perfection and perfectionism and tend to pass that down to our teens. How yeah. can how can we as parents get over that or what are some steps we can take to make sure that we are not driving this perfectionism mindset into our kids? Yeah, yeah. You know what, I think this goes with one of those, what I would call the, uh, uh, just that teaching and training mode. Because I think you move, you know, in your adolescent years, you start moving from lecture to discussion. You, you move from dispelling information to now imparting wisdom. Uh, the Christian life is taught in the earlier years. It is caught in the adolescent years. But this is the other thing that happens, and I think you speak to it very well in your question, that we move from, from the idea that we're perfect in our kids' eyes because they think we are. I mean, they give us these t-shirts these that say 
world's greatest mom and world's greatest dad. I mean, in the coffee mugs and, and all the stuff, they, they, it's like they bring offerings to our feet and say how wonderful our parents. Then they move into adolescence, and everything begins to change, and this is how you can counter it. You look at your kids and say, you know what? I don't expect you to be perfect. And if anybody says, well, no, my kids know that I don't want them to be perfect. Really? Text them right now while we're talking. And just ask them this question. Do you think that we want you to be perfect? Do you think your mom or dad are perfect? And just, and just listen to their comments. Most kids feel like mom and dad want them to be perfect. And mom and dad do want them to do well out of their longings in their own life. But, but I think we've got to be very careful when they move into a world of imperfection that we move alongside them and say, you know what, I don't expect you to be perfect on one side. But then on the other side, I want you to know that I'm not perfect either. And if they say, oh, yes, you are. No, 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 no. I'm imperfect. Well, how are you imperfect? More than you know. More than you know. Because what happens is that during those adolescent years when kids – think they're supposed to be perfect, and they're being told that they're imperfect by everybody around them. They don't want to go hang out with perfect people. They'll connect and make relationship with imperfect people. And what it, that will do is not give license for them to continue a negative behavior. It'll, it'll show them a model and show them how to perhaps respond differently and, and say, it's okay to be perfect but I have needs in my life. And as a result of that need, I have a need for Christ. I have a need for relationships. And I have a need for mom and dad. On that point of, of sharing you know, that we're not perfect to our kids, how much do you think we should share about our past you know, mess-ups or you know, even before yeah. we were a Christian? How much is okay to share? I mean, I'm sure it's age-appropriate. Um, but what are your kind of some guidelines on... Do I, do I share my mistakes and where I've struggled with my kids or not? Where's the balance in that? You know, I think you do. And, but I think you can say it in such a way that, that, that it's not talking about, you know, when I had sex in the back seat of a car. or that, That's not the issue. But, the, but kids are going to ask questions about premarital sex. And, and, uh, and if they do, then, then it's very difficult for parents to steer their kids one way when they know that they've done something different. And so I think it's maybe looking at kids and saying, you know what, I wrestled with that myself. Or it's just saying, like I said a minute ago, more than you know, more than you know. You don't have to go into details. You don't have to share all the little tidbits of stuff and all the big stuff. You just have to go, you know, you, you create an atmosphere where you show some imperfection. And maybe that's by, by engaging with them and saying, you know, your dad's not perfect. I know you think your mom's perfect, but that's not true. And here's some things that I wrestle with. Here's some things I struggle with. I, I think that's what makes a connection between between people. You know, it's, it's like you, Jeff. I, I, mean, I mean, I don't like you because you're perfect. Yeah, I mean, you've got great qualities about you, and, and, and you're a wonderful guy. But I think I enjoy the tearful times or when our dogs die or, or when we show the imperfection or our frailty or our hurts or our... Our, our longings or our sufferings, when we start to share those things, that's really what binds people together. And so that's what I want to do with a, a, a child during the adolescent years. I don't want to carry on a, an atmosphere of perfection. It's not going to work, and it only pushes our kids away. Right, and, and I think, and you've mentioned this before, <laughs> is being very uh, deliberate on not manufacturing those moments but causing some of them maybe to happen you talk about before about how a camp do a camping trip with your family because whenever you do a camping trip something screws up something goes wrong that's and right it's a good bonding time and so can you talk about some other ways you can you know kind of have those moments of yeah. uh, struggle yeah you know I mean spend some time building a fire in the backyard you know and, and sitting around talking uh, you know, if you're going to have discussions with boys, most of those discussions are going to happen shoulder to shoulder uh, than they are face to face. So I've, I've never heard a group of men really go, hey, let's go out on the back porch and share our feelings. I mean, it, it just doesn't work that way. I think it's more that you, you, you do that while you're engaging in something different. So it's important for dads to go, okay, how do you do that shoulder to shoulder? Well, sometimes it may be playing a video game with them and then stopping and having a discussion. Maybe going to a movie where you don't talk and you watch, watch something, but then you leave then and go discuss the movie later. I mean, it's, 
it, it, it's not being so critical. I, I think it's our approach to discussions. We always talk about how to engage with kids, and I think I think it's really how we approach them beforehand. If if we end up uh, creating an atmosphere that that we can talk about things, and I can come across as non-judgmental, then a child will be drawn to me. If a child always feels like all they're going to hear is my opinion being shared all the time, they're going to go someplace else because they can hear a million a million opinions. Uh, on the internet, and and scripture says a fool delights in airing his opinion. It also says that a that a fool appears wise when he keeps his mouth shut. And so there's a part of it where I go, I got to create the atmosphere to have these discussions. And then when I'm in those discussions, I spend time asking questions and just engaging differently, so that so that I'm I'm imparting wisdom in our discussion, and I'm breaking down the barrier of of, of this perfection mindset. So that I want them to know that I, I struggle with the same things you struggle with, or maybe at different levels, but but we can walk through this together because that's the point of it. it, it uh, being a parent, I think, is walking with your child and spending time with them and engaging with them and helping them get to a better place. Uh, just real quick, uh, you gave her some real good practical advice for with boys is standing shoulder to shoulder, and you know I have a daughter as well as a boy, and so it's totally different. What are what are some practical ways? You know, because as men, a lot of times it struggles with that connection with the daughter. We kind of know what boys want because we are one. But how uh, how, you, how do you kind of build those bonding moments with your daughter? You know what? I I think it's I think it's important for us to give time. You know, you know, for every mom that's out there that's watching, they know that time is is of the essence. I I, I don't think a, a father can ever spend enough time with a daughter. I, I think they're always frustrated that it's never enough time. And so I think the intention of, of, of picking a time that we're going to spend on a regular basis becomes important. And it may be just sitting down and having a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I mean, kids that are eight, nine years old do that. It may be going to, you know, the International House of Pancakes or Denny's or a Waffle House just once a week, something different. Not It doesn't have to be a huge restaurant where it's one of a four-star you know, uh, service, but just something very simple so that you can sit and talk so that a child knows, okay, we can spend some time doing this. But, the, you know, don't don't mistake me. I, I think girls love to go fishing. I think they, they love to sit down with their dads. They love to experiment with different things with mom and dad. This is the time to buy a boat and go have fun. And dads, if you're watching, don't ignore your daughter when she starts turning into a young lady. This is the time that she needs you desperately. She'll be... I mean, you'll be the one that determines the type of man that she marries, the type of grandkids you'll have, and, and it's all by the amount of time that you spend. Time equals value. Time is a resource when you share it, that you just spend time doing anything. You'd be driving somewhere. Hey, go with me. Let's sit down and watch their movie with them. Let's sit down and engage with them. Just It's just the spending of time anywhere that works for most of these girls. No, that's great, great advice, very practical advice. Um, we got about uh, five minutes left. I, I want to ask you one question, and, and there's so much more for those people who are joining us now. Um, make sure you go and, and, and listen, and you can listen on the website at parentingtodays, parentingtodaysteens.org. Uh, coming up, the, the five characteristics of a good rule is going to be the program for this weekend. But real quick, Mark, I want to ask you, you, had mentioned, you mentioned it in the broadcast. What, is it, what do you mean by when you talk about transferring control to your teen, especially as they start to, you know, go from the middle school years to junior high, you know, up to high school, what does that mean to transfer control? Yeah, let me let me kind of give you an idea that would help. Uh, everybody, when your child turns 18, 19 years old and they leave home, do you want them to be independent? Do you want them to be in control of their life? Do you want them to make decisions? Do you want to uh, let them flex that decision-making muscle so that they have the strength to handle those challenges that they're going to face. And there, there isn't a parent that would say no to that. We all want that. Okay, at 12 years old, I think we ought to be controlling them like crazy. I mean, duct tape, everything else. I, I say it jokingly. But, but I think we have total control. But between those two points, this being age 12 and this being the time they leave home, I've got to gradually let that line out. And so I've always got to be thinking, what... This week, could I transfer to my child that would give them more control of their life? 
And it means I quit making decisions for them. I, I stop doing things for them. I, I, I don't let my responsibility as a parent become an irresponsible parent. I start to transfer things over to them so that, so that, so that they can learn and be trained to know how to do things so they don't fall flat on their face when they move into that next transition of a job or college or military or getting married, whatever it is. I, I, I've got to be always thinking that I'm not just pleasing, I'm not just protecting, I'm not, not just not providing, but I am preparing my child for the next step of life. Gotcha. Um, you had mentioned, you know, training them to not survive in the zoo, but I mean, to to live in the zoo, but to survive in the jungle. That's one of the things that you're you yeah. always saying. And so, um, do you really do you do you should parents have an actual plan, or should they go through a flow? I know you have in some of your books and stuff some actual you know discussion questions and some you know ways to line that out. How focused should we be on figuring out this teaching versus training process and when it should happen? You know, I, I, I think you've got to be very intentional about it because if not, your kids get frustrated. And when they get frustrated, they start acting out. If you don't give them the freedom that they need at the time that they need it, they'll rebel and they'll get it some other way. They'll push the envelope a little bit. I, I would rather be graceful and give it to them early than force them to have to fight for something that they're going to end up uh, having anyway. And whether that be later curfews or a second glass of milk when they eat cookies or, or where they park a bicycle to where they park a car, whatever it is, you know, I want to start transferring things to them and, and let them start being prepared for that next step. Here's a, here's a personal question. Um, I have a, a, an older boy and a younger girl. They're about uh, 16 months apart, but I'm giving the, my son a little more freedom than my daughter just because of the age and you know I'm trying to do this moving them into a training yeah. He's, he's a little farther ahead. How do you deal with that struggle between siblings when older brother is getting stuff that they want, like a phone or something like that? How do you deal yeah. with those kind of those those struggles as a parent? <laughs> you know, you build hope. You build hope into the situation. That's what you do. You tell your child, hey, 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 hey. You know, at this age, you don't get a phone, but you're going to in two years, or you're going to in a year. It may be saying, you know, your brother gets to make a decision about what church he goes to, because he's 16 and he can drive and he can get there. When you're 16, you get to do that. But, but this, this is what we're going to hold to. What you do is you come up with a plan as to the various steps that you're going to go through throughout a child's years at home. They're only going to be at home six, seven years during adolescence. Hopefully. Hopefully it's not going to be that they're there till 28 years old. But, I mean, what you do is you come up with a plan, and when you start sharing, you don't get to do that now, but you'll get to do that next year. And then the next year you'll get to do this. And then the next year you get to do this. What that does is give a child hope. I'm not there yet, but I don't have to rebel to get it because I know that it's going to be offered to me soon. Gotcha. And so what I'm hearing for you in that from you in that is that constant communication is is what is needed. You're not just saying, Oh, sorry, can't do that because you're not as they know because you have constantly been talking about this is what's happening. We've had these expectations already. Um, this, you know, and, and sticking to those um, as you're talking with your your child. Absolutely. You know, Jeff. Most people have great discussions after conflict, and uh, and so they just wait for points of conflict. Sometimes I think kids cause conflict just to get mom and dad to spend time with them. Sometimes I really think they go, and eh, it's gonna. I'm gonna do this and see what happens. I'll get some attention. You know, and we live in that world that's an appearance and performance world, so kids want somebody to pay attention to them because it means value. So if they're not getting value from a dad that doesn't spend any time at home, they're going to find value somewhere, and they'll find it through somebody giving them attention. And, uh, and so it becomes really important to say, okay, how am I going to have that constancy of communication and that constancy of direction and guidance and discussion? That becomes really important. Great. Well, we're right at the half hour mark. Mark, I want to give you a real quick chance to talk about what you're, what's coming up for you, where you're going to be at, um, um, and just kind of let us know what's happening in the world of Mark Gregston. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I mean, the fact that I'm sitting down at my desk is almost a miracle because I'm gone almost every weekend. Um, I spend time writing articles, for, whether it be our weekly newsletter that goes out or, or uh, traveling and doing seminars around the country. I'll... Uh, I'll be in um, 
I'm trying to think. I, I, I'm in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, the uh, the end of this month, and then throughout. Uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon, the end of the month as well for a, a number of uh, activities. I'm going to be on TV with Kirk Cameron uh, the end of May um, in uh, Orange County, uh, California, and uh, I'm just trying to think of things right off at the top of my head. I'm going to be in Westlake Village, California, Calvary Community Church preaching on Father's Day, and so. Uh, people can find out about my schedule, where I'm going to be, and the seminars we lead and all that. They can find that on parentingtodaysteens.org. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks Great. so much. Thanks for being being on the show. And, and we're going to try to do this every uh, second win the second Wednesday and the fourth Wednesday of, of each month. Try to do these uh, seminar these webinars with Mark. And so, if you'd like to find out more about Parenting Today's Teens, you can go to, like Mark said, www.parentingtodaysteens.org. We'd love for you to sign up for our free newsletter, where you can go and you can get articles from Mark that come out weekly that talk about stuff we talked about today, parenting teens, and 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 uh, and listen to the radio show because he gets people uh, kids from. Um, that he has there at Heartlight, and they discuss why they're there, the struggles they have, and, and Mark talks about issues that are facing parents today. And so we'd really love it for, for you guys to come and sign up for our newsletter. I really appreciate you being here for our first webinar. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.